So my name is Sheree um, and I'm a member of the Fostering Connections team. I'm a little bit nervous, so a bit. This is my first live event. I've only recently joined the team. Um, so please bear with me if there's any anything I have to navigate in this space. I've never done a live before. Um, and I'm really happy to have my co-sider Bron in the background there helping me out. Um, I'm also really excited to talk to you today about foster care. Um, the information I'll be discussing today is about the Victorian foster care system. So please be aware that if you're joining us from another state in Australia, or maybe from another country, that things will vary. Before I begin, I acknowledge that, I'm, that the land that in which I live and work on is the traditional land of the people wrong people of the Gundi Jamara Ma, who have cared for these lands and waters for many thousands of years. I acknowledge and respect the cultural diversity of the many people I work with and share land with, and I support the principles of reconciled Australia for all its people in the interests of the children who are tomorrow's leaders. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so Fostering Connections, to give you a bit of background, we are Victoria's statewide foster care recruitment service. It's run by the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare, who are the peak body for child and family services in Victoria. So if you happen to decide to pick up the phone after today and make an inquiry or go through our website, um, it, I might be one of the people that you end up chatting to to find out some further information or have a referral onto a service. Um, at Fostering Connections, we provide support and information to prospective foster carers, as well as public education about foster care in Victoria. So anyone can call Fostering Connections or visit our website to receive information. Um, we can talk you through the process, similar to what I'll do today, so you, but you might have some more specific questions about your circumstances. And when you're ready, we can help you take the next steps. Um, a little bit about me. I have been working in foster care for about five years. So I've had a very variety of roles. I've worked in case management, working closely with young people, their families and the foster carers. I've also um, worked in recruiting and retention of foster carers. So that's stepping side by side along with people who are interested and taking them through the process to become accredited and having their first placement. It's a really, really exciting process and I really love getting to know the people that are interested in this work and I admire them so much. Maybe that's going to be you one day. Um, let's talk about, I guess, I guess, let's clarify what foster care is because there's a few myths and misconceptions about foster care and as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about the foster care system in Victoria and things do vary state by state. So foster care is the temporary care of children and young people by members of the community who have become trained and accredited foster carers. Foster care is about looking after and supporting the children and young people between the ages of zero to 18 who are unable to live at home or with other family members. In most of the cases, the children do return home to their families and be that their mother and father, or maybe there's other family members that are able to support them. And that is the best, best case scenario that we want for these kids, because connections to family is really, really important for identity. Um, foster carers play a key role in supporting children to stay connected to their family in their time in care and stay connected to their community as well. Um, one of the things that I think is really, really important is to be able to have a large pool of foster carers that agencies can call upon so that a child can stay in their community. We don't want to have them experiencing the grief and loss of coming out of their home and have that compiled by, they have to maybe relocate schools, lose some friends, miss out on sporting clubs. So the more carers that each agency has, the more opportunity we have to keep kids in their communities, which is really, really important. On average, there are about 12,500 children and young people in out-of-home care. Um, and that's over about September of last year, that last statistic was, um, was looked at. And there's about 1,500 children in Victoria that are in foster care. Um, as I said, that's an average number, but it is quite a big number. If you think back on the size of some of the schools that you might know of, even consider the size of a football club, 
imagine how many of those young children potentially could be in care if they were all of that number. Is there, feel free, I can see a few people watching, check anything in the chat that you want to ask. I'm happy to answer questions. And as I said earlier, please feel free to reach out and contact us. Um, our email address is fcinquiry at cfecfw.asn.au, which is in the chat. You can also pick up the phone and chat to us, 1800 013 08. <clears throat> so children who are in foster care have normally come into care because they're facing um, an unsafe home environment. There's something going on for their families, um, which is out of their control. The children in all these cases, are, they love their families, despite what happened. We all, we all have that natural instinct to love our parents, um, but maybe their parents are experiencing some hard times and they don't know how to, how to help themselves and look after their children at the same time. So that is why the key focus when children are taken out of their homes is to try and re reunify them and make their homes as safe as possible wherever we can. And foster carers can play a really, really wonderful role in that. I've seen some examples of foster carers who have had the young children built up a really, really lovely um, relationship with their, the biological mum. The children have returned home and their mum's had some, some health issues. And there's been a, a safe enough relationship there that the carer has been able to reach out and offer a bit of support. And they've had an ongoing relationship with the children. That doesn't happen in every case. Sometimes the children will ret return home and you just have to be comforted in the fact that you've provided a safe and loving experience for them for that period in their life. So one of the barriers that I often hear about when people have said, I've been thinking about becoming a foster carer, but I just don't know if I have the time that I can commit because um, foster care is, you know, you've got to have a lot of time to look after these kids. And I'd actually like to correct that, that myth that's floating around out there. Foster care can actually be really, really flexible. And there's a few different categories of care. And we need carers from all walks of life to help match with these kids to give them the best experience and the best chance. So I'm going to step through the types of care that you can provide. So there's four key areas. There's respite emergency, short-term and long-term. So respite, I think we've all heard that phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. And if you think about the circumstances where maybe in a family of your own or friends that you know, they might have grandparents, there might be aunties and uncles, there might be close friends. And if mum or dad have an event to go to or they're a little bit sick or they're just a little bit tired, those people step in and they might take the young person just to give mum and dad a bit of a break. That is very similar with respite. We have children that are in full-time care with carers, but those carers sometimes need a little bit of downtime. They might need to, maybe they've got a wedding to attend to, or they've got a work commitment they need to go out of town for. Or perhaps it's just about building an extra safe relationship in that young person's life. So respite carers are invaluable. It might be, you know what, I can only commit to one weekend every couple of months, but that might make so much difference to a young person or to the, the full-time carers that are looking after that young person. And if that's all you can commit at this point in time, that is fine. The next type of care is emergency care. So from my experience working in an agency, you might get a call in the afternoon that something has occurred and child protection um, need a placement for a young person. Maybe they're picking them up from school and they need something for them that night. It could be the middle of the night as well that you might get a phone call and say, hey, something's happened and we're looking to, for something for this young person. Are you available to take them for the night? So emergency care is normally around a couple of days until some further planning can be done to find something. Um, from being one of the people that help arrange those emergency placements, those emergency carers, all of our carers are valuable. 
But in that point of crisis, when you're you're two o'clock in the morning and you need somebody, or four thirty in the afternoon and you're about to knock off work, to know that you've got a handful of carers that will willingly take a young person with some limited information sometimes is so so helpful. And you just know that that young person is going to be safe until further planning can take place next day. The next type of care is short term. Um, this tends to be anything up to about six months. So what happens when a young person comes into care? Um, the courts are involved and because our key goal is to reunify children with their families wherever possible, sometimes the families need time to get that sorted out. So they'll normally go on some reunification orders and that might be mum and dad have to do X, Y and Z while they fix some things in their home so they can have their young person return. In the meantime, we need to be able to plan for a few months for a young person to stay somewhere safe. And that's when you have short-term care. Um, the child would be with you seven days a week, unless of course you've got some respite planned. Um, and you'd be working with your care team at the agency. The next type of care is long-term. So that can be anything up to the point of when a young person turns 18, really. Um, and I've experienced some really, really amazing um, carers where they they still welcome the young person in their home beyond that point. Um, and they've been able to be side by side with that young person, maybe still liaising with their family um, as they, you know, go from primary school into secondary school, get their first job and then finish finish school and go on to whatever else they, they think is the next step for them in life. Um, that can be a really, really rewarding experience for those carers, um, and it is a long, longer-term commitment. Sometimes, though, long-term care might just be a 12-month period, so it can vary a lot. Before I spoke about how foster care can be really, really flexible, and I guess from my experience is you might choose to be accredited for all four of these categories, but at this point in your life, it may only suit you to provide short-term and respite care where you can have some planning around it. But then some, some circumstances might change and you're like, yep, I'm open to providing long-term care. And then something else might change and you can talk to your agency and go, you know what, I just need a little bit of a break for a bit and that is perfectly okay. Um, we've had families that provide a variety of um, types of care and maybe they have their own biological children that are going in doing BCE and they want to be able to keep the house calm and stable while their young people are going through that. So they go, you know what, when we get to about June of that year, we're going to go on hold until we can get through VCE exams and everything. Perfectly understandable. Um, we've also had experience with maybe the family's welcoming their own a new baby into the home. So they have to think about what's going to fit for them moving forward. In saying that too, um, we have carers from all walks of life. Um, so you can be working, not working. Um, it could be full-time, part-time work. Uh, we've had plenty of nurses who are brilliant foster carers and that may, but we just have to be able to align the placement to match whatever their roster is doing. And I really, really encourage you that if you're feeling that you can't commit to things in a, a long-term period, to pick up the phone and have a chat to an agency about what your availability is and what you're concerned about, and they will work with you to find a plan. The reality is that there are more kids that need foster care placements than the number of carers that we have. And we want to be able to prevent young people from staying here for a couple of weeks and then moving to the next place for a couple of weeks and oh in a month's time perhaps they're going to have to go stay in another town and lose some connection so the more carers that we have the less that happens and the less the impact on the young person um, in saying that like, i'm talking about all the benefits of fostering to the young person but there are benefits for the foster carers too um, apologies if i tear up over this but i have a personal personal story from a, a carer that I knew really, really well from working with them. They'd had a young person in their care for several years. 
and um, the young girl had experienced some abuse and she was, had some mistrust in males. And after about five years, I was sitting down doing supervision with the male carer and he had a little bit of a celebration that he wanted to share with me. The young girl had wanted to go to the movies and she asked him to take her. I said, oh, that's really lovely. But then he explained it further. Five years earlier, she would never, ever have asked for him to take her anywhere alone. And a year earlier, he would never have been asked to take her either. And yes, she had asked another seven people before she asked him. But he was taking pride in the fact that she had finally felt safe enough to ask him to go and do this thing with her, this activity, without anyone else, without the female carer who she had her primary attachment to. And he said, my heart is just full. I feel so happy that she's showing signs of trust and safety. So sorry, that's a little bit of a sentimental one for me um, because of several years that I've watched that young girl grow and develop and feel secure because of the safe safety of the, the household that she's living in and the love and care that those carers have shown her. She still has connections to family, which is really, really important, and the carers are supportive of that. But that's the, the type of rewards that you might get. I've had other carers tell me that they've randomly had someone reach out to them that they cared for 10 years ago on Facebook to tell them, hey, I remember you. I re can't remember, could, struggled to remember your name, but I saw you and I remember that you had a, a little black puppy dog that used to sit on the end of my bed and I used to just love patting at night. So it's all those those little things. The fact that you've just played one small part in a young person's life, gave them one positive experience to help them through a really, really difficult time in their life. So back on to what I'm meant to be talking about. Um, I've got a note here, how long do placements last? Well, I've kind of talked through that a little bit. Um, placements do vary. I will be completely honest, sometimes maybe we pick up the phone and we'll say, we need an emergency placement for tonight. And then the next day we'll call you back and we'll, if you're, if you're listed for short term or long term, we might say, do you have any capacity to have this young person to continue on with you? And if you do, then who knows? It depends. We want to keep the children in as few of placements as possible. We want them to stay stable. We don't want them bouncing from carer to carer. Um, it, it just becomes messy and then the young person can become more confused about what they're experiencing because they're already missing what they're used to in their home. Um, maybe we move on, we chat a little bit about the care requirements to becoming a foster carer. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the, the chat or else you can phone us on 1800 013 and you can check out our website as well, Fostering Connections. So the key requirements to becoming a foster carer, you need to be 21 years of age. You need to have a spare room. The young person needs to have a safe space that they can live in your home. Um, in most cases, um, you need to be an Australian resident or permanent citizen. There are some um, exceptions, and that's something that I would rather chat to an individual about specifically. And you also need to be able to pass some key checks such as a police check and obtain a working with children's check. Um, but that's that's about it. So anybody can become a, a foster carer. And the big thing that we're at Foster and Connections that we're trying to promote at the moment is that we want the Victorian community to get behind foster care and play a part, play a part in supporting these young people that need a safe and stable um, home for that period of time until their family or permanent planning can take place. So you could be single, you could be married or partnered, um, LGBTIQA+, that is perfectly fine. You could um, come from a different culture, you could have religious beliefs, you might not at all. It takes all people. Um, I suppose when you look at it, our 
our young people that we see coming into care, they are so diverse that we need a diverse range of carers to be able to match them with. Um, and it can even be simple things like perhaps you have a really big interest in arts and crafts. So if an agency has a pool of people um, of carers and then this particular carer they know enjoys that and this child has a real artistic flair, they might see if they can match you up because that's something that's going to really work for that young person and it's probably something you're going to enjoy too. Um, if we have a child of um, a particular um, cultural background, it'd be great if we could have a pool of carers where we can match the child so they're within their community. That might be you. Um, yeah, any questions at all? Nothing. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. Everyone. I'm still feeling very nervous about this. <laughs> so, this is the big bit the, the process to become a foster carer. Once you pick up the phone and have a chat, um, on average, it can take about six to nine months, give or take, depending on your circumstances and how ready you are. Um, and also the agency that you're working with, how, how much work they've got going on and their availability as well. Um, the process essentially um, involves meeting with an agency and getting some initial information. They'll talk to you about some of the, the supports and values that they work by. Um, and from there, um, you'd fill in some application forms, you know, because we all love a bit of paperwork. And then there's two days of mandatory training. Personally, if you're interested, I highly recommend that you see this process through up to that training. The training is fantastic. It talks through the reasons of why children come into care. Um, it talks about um, the development of their brain because of the trauma they may have experienced. It talks about behaviours and how to respond to them. Um, it and it talks about culture and how that people can support um, diversity of the children coming into care. Um, it really, really does give some good insight and strategies into what to possibly expect um, because you don't know what you don't know. So the, the process for becoming a carer is called step by step and it definitely is treated that way. We do it one step at a time and at any point you're not ready to continue, you can put it on pause and come back to it later. So my personal recommendation, pick up the phone, get engaged with an, a, an agency in your area, um, have them meet with you, get some further information and do that training and see what you think. If you decide to proceed after that point, you'll go through what we call the assessment phase where they do some meetings with you, and they're looking at how you how you would imagine you might respond to different behaviours, how you work with others because caring is teamwork, um, your motivations, and they also want to know a little bit about you because in this process, the agencies need to support you. Your wellbeing is really, really, really important as well. It's not all about the kids. Um, I think there's that term of you can't pour from an empty cup. So the more an agency can get to know you, the more that they can support you in this caring journey. Um, I've got a question there. Does everyone in house have to go through training? Um, the care applicants have to, and if there's anyone providing a care role, um, we do need them to go um, and complete the training. And to be honest, we've had, um, I remember an, an experience I had where there was a 16 year old in a household who put together a PowerPoint presentation telling her parents why her family should become foster carers. So when they came to the training, she actually came along with them. And that has been such a successful household because they are all in it together. Um, she understands why mum and dad might respond to the young person differently to how she experienced growing up. Um, she has an understanding of the background. Um, so if there's any adult or maybe those later teens, have a chat to the agency about what they recommend. Um, but it is a really, really great idea to have all the household members complete the training. But if you are a couple, 
the expectation is that you'd be applying as a couple and that both of you, because you're providing a caring role, both of you need to complete that training as well. Um, what else? From, from there, you, your assessors will put together a report which you have an opportunity to read. People have fed back to it. It's like, it's like seeing your, um, everything about you on paper, but it is really quite cathartic going through that process. Um, and that's presented to a, a panel of people at your agency um, who make any recommendations of anything they can see that will help support you in your fostering journey further. Um, so this process takes some time, but I think most people understand it is so, so thorough because we want to make sure we're, we're matching carers to children and that we're doing all the checks and balances to make sure that we're getting the right people to look after these children. Any, any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. If there's anything you're not comfortable with, as I mentioned, feel free to call on 1800 013 088, or you can check out the Fostering Connections website, or I think we've got it posted in the chat already. Our, um, our line is FC Inquiry at cfecfw.asn.au. Now, um, there's a few things that I often hear that are misconceptions around fostering. I've already talked a little bit about that you, you don't need to be in a relationship. Um, we're actually seeing a trend of a, more and more people who are single applicants wanting to foster. Um, also seeing a trend in some, some areas where um, perhaps it's young professionals who have had not had any children themselves. So you don't have to have any care experience of looking after children. You, um, you'll be given support and training and education on how you need to respond to the young person in your home. You don't need to own your home. Um, a lot of people are renting, and but they maybe they're renting and they've had children of their own, they've moved out, the room's free. Per perfect opportunity. Um, the key thing with the space of your home is that there's adequate room for a young person to play depending upon their age and that they have a, a room to themselves for their own privacy in their own space. Um, we get asked sometimes if uh, kids can share a room. Typically you would only place siblings in a room together and that is a bit of a case-by-case -case, um, system where agencies need to be looking at what's going on for the young people I mean, I'm sure we've all seen, sometimes siblings don't always get along the best either. Um, with that too, I was talking before about the different types of care and how that can be flexible. You might also say, you know what, I'm really, really not comfortable caring for teenagers. And when you're working through that with the agency and doing the assessment process, you can say, you know what, I, I only want to care up to about to primary school age kids. Or I've seen the flip side of it where someone said, I am so done with changing nappies. I don't want to see another nappy in my life. So then what we might do is we'll work through and we'll be looking to place kids with them who are outside of that, that phase of their life. And that is okay because it takes all carers to care for all types of children. Um, what might suit you might not suit the next person and vice versa. So there is no barrier with what you feel comfortable with because that's something that you can work through with your agency. Um, another barrier that I feel I've come across in talking to people in the communities is people are concerned about what type of behaviour they could expect and whether they have the skills to respond to that. So I think a really key component to keep in mind is that these children have experienced trauma in their life and on top of that, they experience grief and loss from having, having to leave their family home and everything that they know. Um, they may not have the, the words and the vocabulary to talk about how they're feeling. And as a result, what we end up seeing is some pain-based behaviours coming out. Um, there's, there's studies done that in children in particular, all behaviour is trying to communicate something with us. But so for these young people who haven't got the words to talk about feeling 
unsafe, feeling scared, feeling alone, that might come out in their behaviours. Um, in the training package that I talked about that's mandatory for you to continue in your application, they talk about strategies and how to respond to that. In addition, you have the support of your agency around you. Um, you're able to talk you to your workers about what's going on. They will give you some tips because each child is an individual. There might be different things that, um, that works for one child that doesn't work for another. There's also access to free training to support you and upskill you through Carer Cafe. Um, so they deliver training to foster and kinship carers on a whole range of different topics to help carers feel supported and confident in their skills to be able to respond to the needs of the young person in their care. Another thing I think I've heard before is, you know, I'm only one person, I can't make a difference. Um, if you heard my story earlier about the, the male carer being asked to, to take the young person to the movies and that was the first time she had reached out for him to do anything like that, um, he, he's made a difference in her life. And it can be some of the smallest things um, that you may not even end up knowing about, but we never know when that one experience is going to change the trajectory of a young person's life. You don't know what interaction um, is going to sit in the back of their mind and comfort them at some other point. You just don't know. So I think everyone can make a difference. And it's about being kind and supportive and role modeling and just showing them that things can be okay, that they have rights, um, they have the right to feel safe, to go to school, um, to be engaged in their community. Um, and that's something that if you're fostering, you can demonstrate to them. Um, so one person can make a difference. And any of the carers I've spoken to, they they all say there's always those couple of moments in their that they sit in the back of their mind of those beautiful experiences that they've had with their young people. Is there if there's any any thoughts that anyone wants to know about? I've got one more thing that I'm going to finish on today. Um, I think the reality is we're all feeling um, financially how things how tough things are getting the the price in the supermarket everything's going up can't deny it um in my experience of working with people who are applying to be foster carers I actually was quite surprised I went through a phase where people were reaching out and saying I've been waiting to put my hand up until I know that I could afford to take on an extra person in our household um there is a financial reimbursement for foster carers um it starts from around about $440 per fortnight and it's tiered and goes up. Um, and that's based upon the types of support and needs that the young person needs. Um, that reimbursement is tax free, so it doesn't impact your tax. It doesn't impact Centrelink at the same time. If you're going for a loan, you cannot count it as income. Um, it is a reimbursement. It doesn't cover the cost of everything. Um, but then agencies also have some wonderful supports in place too. Um, they might have some donations that come in around Christmas time. So then you've got support of being able to provide some extra gifts to a young person. Or perhaps a young person is insistent, they need glasses, they don't want the, the pair that, that they're able and entitled to through their healthcare card. Instead, they want that particular one. You know what teenagers can be like. Um, so maybe it's something that you can have a conversation with the agency about and maybe that is something that will help the young person and they might have some donations that are coming where they're able to find um, funding for that. Obviously, you need to be speaking with your agency first about what's available, but there are a variety of supports that different agencies have access to. Um, so it's a matter of talking to them, but you're not expected to pay for everything out of your own pocket with these young people living with you. And I think that's really important that people know that, particularly in the climate that we're in at the moment. Um, 
I can see that we've just gone over half an hour and I'm probably aware that some people might be on their, their lunch break. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, I encourage you, if you're thinking about it, jump onto our website. Um, and there's plenty of stories, there's plenty of information on there. Or pick up the phone and have a chat one on one with me, 1800 013 088. And if you think you're ready to take the next steps, either through our website or by talking to us directly, we can help link you in with um, an agency in your area that can talk to you specifically about the support that they offer and what their specific process is. Um, please consider playing a part and helping the community of young people that need a place to stay. Thank you, everyone.